First things first, those of you that have not had me in class before, I do record my classes. Uh, Florida Law says that when a recording is going on, uh, people that are on possibly on the recording need to be notified that they're on a recording. So therefore, I'm notifying you right now that you're on a recording because I'm recording class. Okay. Uh, the benefit of this is that I can get these posted online. Uh, so if you miss something or if you want to review something, it com becomes a very handy way to keep up with class. Uh, so these recordings, like, they get posted on uh, YouTube. They're video recordings. Uh, sometimes I'll use the camera. Sometimes it'll just be the slideshow with my voice over it. Um, it also records my desktop when I do demonstrations up here. Um, because I'm doing the recording and because the microphone in the laptop is recording my, my voice, uh, I tend to be a little more tied to the laptop than some other people that use this room. So I apologize if, I feel, if it feels like I'm sitting down here and if you're in the back and you're doing this, kind of trying to see me as Hunter's doing and Katie's doing back there, okay. Uh, I apologize for that. I, I, I had at one point a, a clip-on microphone so I could move around a little bit better, uh, but the microphone cable's a little wonky and I have yet to uh, buy a, a replacement for it, so I need to get on that basically. Hopefully I can get that and get it um, replaced. So um, as I told, so, so some of you came in a little bit after I uh, said we are going to be using the computer, so make sure your computer's up and running. Uh, the syllabus is on Blackboard, so I didn't print copies uh, because we can save however many trees by not uh, spending the paper, so you can look at it electronically. Um, we will be looking at the syllabus today, but we will not be spending 50 minutes on the syllabus today, okay? Uh, if, if I, uh, let's put it this way, if I get to 20 after, and I'm still talking about the syllabus, 20 after, maybe 20, 25 after, and I'm still talking about the syllabus, somebody say something to me because I'm off my schedule, okay? Um, what I want to do first, uh, uh, just to kind of get to know each other, I know most of your names, and those of you that I didn't know before walking in this room, I was able to use process of elimination to get to know you, uh, to, to know your name, but if we could just uh, make sure everybody else knows your name uh, by going around the room and having you introduce yourself and answer this question, what do you want to get out of this class, okay? So uh, again, you're addressing your classmates. You might need to pop your head up and, and, and look. So let's, uh, I know you, you've all got distractions in front of you. So let's pay attention and make sure you get everybody's name. So we'll start over here, Matt. Introduce yourself to the class. My name is Matt, and I'm a digital life major, and I took the Dr. Process class last year, and uh, we were really interested in audio. So taking this one and the process of the class at the same time to further my Okay. Doesn't need to be a long answer, just, <laughs> yeah, real quick. Hi, uh, my name is Solomon. I'm also a digital arts major. Uh, saw Dr. Bullock's um, presentation last semester on synthesis and digital music, and that interested me enough to just take this class. Okay, cool. Hey everyone, I'm Marcus. Uh, I'm a composition major, and I took this class because, well, I want to get into scoring, and I know there's a lot, um, a lot of electronic stuff that goes into it, so I'm going to learn something here. Cool. Hey guys, I'm Maggie Meggs, and you can't see me at all, but I'm um, I So I also need a composition major, and I'm very interested in what computer music can offer me. Um, I'm Katie. Uh, I just kind of want to like have the skills to actually make music that I want to make. Okay. I'm Victoria. I'm interested in the concept and aspect of live performance. I'm Nico. I'm also a composition major, and uh, I believe that a composer should be able to be well rounded in various different um, areas of music. Catherine Renee Metcalf, I am doing this class as a further exploration of interests. Okay. I'm Christian Gonzalez, and um, I'm a composition and viola performance major, and um, what I want is the same as Marcus Maggie. Okay. <laughs> I'm Matt, I'm another composition major. Um, just taking this to learn more skills that I can use, and because my degree I said I had to. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm Ian. I'm a digital arts major. Um, I love weird sounds, so I want to know how to make those from scratch. Yeah. You know, and actually use a modular sound for once. Okay. So. Hi, I'm Casey. I'm a music technology major. Um, I'm very interested in audio recording and production and engineering and sound and all that. 
Hi, I'm Tony. Hi, I'm Adega, major, I'm a senior, and I'm also the station manager of the radio station on campus. So if you want a radio show, like your own radio show. <laughs> oh, oh, well, no. uh, my name is Hunter, I'm a digital arts major, and uh, I, I'm not sure really when I get out of class, but I think that there's a lot of really cool opportunities with something as uh, uh, interesting as, as software synthesizers. Okay. Uh, hey guys, uh, my name is Jack. Um, I'm a digital arts major, and what, and what I want out of this class is just knowledge that I can use after I get out. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is AJ. I'm a digital arts major. Uh, I'm just interested in furthering my skills in music production and the like. So. Okay. Yeah, my name is Marcus. I'm a digital arts major as well. I want to learn more about synthesizers. Okay. And I just walked in late. Introduce yourself and what do you want to get from the class? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So we've got a variety of people coming in with a variety of backgrounds. Uh, not, I'd say like two or three different backgrounds, right? We've got the digital arts majors and the music technology folks that are more on the interested in the production side of things, but also creating their own music. We also have some, some people coming from the music school, uh, from the composition background, that they have uh, their interest in terms of composition. Um, but all of it is about kind of is about creating, okay? Uh, and I'm hopeful that I've organized this in such a way that we can uh, accomplish that both in the context of creating pieces of music that can be on either a concert or on an album or online or whatever distribution channel you want to go through these days because there's so many of them. Uh, but you can also use these skills to uh, tackle other problems, okay? And we'll get to that um, as I talk about the projects. So the title of this class is Computer Music, and I need to start with a little bit of backstory, okay? It's actually 20 years ago this semester that I talked my way into DA461, which is the, this class, basically, as a sophomore at Stetson University, okay? At the time, Dr. DeMurga was teaching it, so if you talk to him, okay? Uh, and we were using C sound running on an SGI Unix workstation where we had to uh, basically type up the instrument and the score, and then we had to hit enter to render out the sound and then a few hours later we could listen to the output from the the, the compiling basically to, to know what it is we had done basically. Uh, our textbook was the Curtis Rhodes computer music tutorial which if you've seen that book it's about it's about well it's about the size that the phone book was at that time. The phone book's gotten thinner now as people just look things up on Google right but it's like that thick basically. Um, and so a lot has changed in those 20 years, yes? Okay. Um, and this class and its evolution as I took over the reins from Dr. DeMurga and someone else, we had someone who was a visiting who was teaching it for a while and uh, then I kind of came back to it. Um, the class has evolved over time and it, in looking at it and preparing for it this year, I felt like it needed to evolve again, okay? Uh, and looking at the state of where things are, computer music is almost... Uh, an old title, basically, because the way people make electronic music these days is not just computer-based, right? Uh, it's computer and there's this and there's been this resurgence in hardware. It's not just building your own solutions. There's a lot that off-the-shelf software can do for you in order to create your own custom sound design solutions. And so, really, in rebuilding this course this summer, which is literally uh, uh, one of my bigger projects this summer was rebuilding this course, and I've been thinking about it. Uh, for a few months even leading up to this summer, I was thinking about it more in terms of electronic music and sound design, okay? So uh, we're not, I, I'm not quite at the point, let's see, I can't just arbitrarily change the course title, <laughs> okay? Uh, there's processes for changing the course title, but know that in the back of my brain in terms of how I've built this course, I'm thinking more in this direction basically, okay? Um, hopefully nobody's too upset that we would go in this direction because there's enough overlap between electronic music and sound design and computer music and computer music really is a part of electronic music and sound design okay um, and I hope what you will get out of this redesign is a more 
a, a richer, more varied experience out of the course because we're going to be looking at uh, a variety of tools, okay? Um, and those tools break down into really three categories, okay? Uh, we're going to be looking at Ableton Live, which I'm very happy we were able to add Ableton Live to our suite of applications. It's been a number of years. I've had students that like get live on their own and learn it and do work in it. Um, and I've kind of watched from a distance. I, I, I bought my own personal first copy back in 2012 before I went on sabbatical. I played a little bit around with it on sabbatical and continued playing around with it. Uh, but really dove in this summer trying to learn how Ableton Live works and how it can be used. What's great about Live compared to other DAWs is the fact that it's um, it has both a production angle to it and a performance angle to it. You can use it in, it's built so that you can use it in producing things that are static and done or you can use it in a live performance environment. Okay, uh, That's a, a lot different than Pro Tools and Logic which some people shoehorn those into a live performance environment, but they were never really intended by their software designers to be live performance environments. Live was intended to be a live performance environment, okay? Uh, we're going to be looking at Max. Max is the environment that I have the most familiarity with. I've been using Max since 1997, okay? So uh, I know it really, really well, okay? Um, so. <laughs> Uh, if you have a question about how to do something in Max, the, ch the chances are I can explain two or three different ways to do it uh, uh, for you, okay? Uh, but the nice thing is about Max and Live is uh, they've built a bridge between these two pieces of software. You can actually crack open, you can actually run Max, you, you maybe see in that upper, hey, Anthony, come on in. There's some seats on this end. Um, you might be able to see in the upper left-hand corner of my slide here, there's a little tab that says Max for Live, okay? You can actually run Live inside, or excuse me, Max inside the Live environment as a plugin, basically, which means that you can actually rewrite the plugin uh, inside of your Live session, which essentially Live just becomes the overarching organizing timeline for your uh, your custom solutions, basically, inside of Max, okay? So that's that's, I think... The other real driver for with adding uh, Ableton Live is that there's a complement and a, and a bridge between these two that allows you to create your own custom solutions for electronic music, okay? Uh, and then the other piece of it that kind of some things fell into place to allow us to, to move into hardware, okay? Um, I've got two people that are on the guest list for in these early weeks that actually made some uh, significant contributions to helping us get to the point where I can actually cover hardware in this class, okay? So hardware synthesis and add that in as a component of the class, okay? So I'm really thinking about these three different uh, sets of tools, if you will, for this class. Uh, and it was intentional to then schedule this class three days a week because uh, as I started looking at how to organize these three different, because this is a lot to cover in, in a semester basically, and we're not going to master all three of these. And some of you will gravitate more toward one solution or the other, and that's okay. Okay, I, hopefully I've given you enough lee leeway toward the end to kind of move in the direction you want to you want to move to create your own solution for the final project, okay? And then hopefully we'll build on those. Those of you that choose to go on to Computer Music 2, uh, you can build on those skills in uh, the, the with using the tools of your choice and also working on your skills uh, in the other areas as well, okay? Um, but in, in working on the class, I tried building the schedule two different ways. First, I, I, I had us kind of run through live and then run through Macs and then run through hardware and then give you a final project where you can mix those things. In the end, I decided that it was better to use the three days of week to our advantage, basically. So if you've taken a look at the syllabus, which I emailed all of you like two weeks ago, and none of you dropped the class, so thanks, uh, you may have noticed that on the schedule in the early weeks, we're going to use the three days a week to our advantage. We're going to be covering live stuff on Mondays, Mac stuff on Wednesdays, and hardware stuff on Fridays, okay? And hopefully what we'll do is kind of create a comparative approach between those three things, where the theme of the week might be basic waveforms. Okay, well, let's look at where we can find those in live. Let's look at where we can find those in max. Let's look at how we can use those in a modular environment, okay? That's kind of my idea here in the first couple weeks of how to structure the class, okay? So, so I want you to know that going in, that that's how I've built this, the structure of the class. Any questions about that idea? Okay. Uh, and I, 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 I mentioned 
we've, we've gotten some uh, upgrades here on our, on our hardware uh, a bit. So we've got uh, a small Eurorack uh, case, which I have here. I'll, I'll get to hopefully at the end of class if I don't talk too long. Uh, and then also our Synthi has gotten some TLC and some upgrade, and all of the oscillators are now working. I think the only thing that doesn't work is the meter, which if you plug it into some speakers, you know that sound is coming out, so you're good to go, right? Okay. Um, so it's, it's up and running and, and working as well, and we'll do some work with that, okay? Uh, that's what we're going to be doing on the hardware end of things. Um, so if you've, got, if you've got Blackboard open, uh, you should be able to find in the syllabus and fact folder the syllabus. Um, just my, my um, and I've kind of talked through some of this, my, my idea is that you will, in this class, gain experience with multiple tools, okay? So that th this is not just a Max class, this is not just an Ableton Live class, this is not just a hardware class. You're going to gain some experience, some exposure to all of those things through your projects, okay? Um, I want you to be able to distinguish between different techniques so that when someone says to you frequency modulation but they mean amplitude modulation, you should know the difference between those two things, okay? Uh, and you should be able to apply uh, proper terminology when discussing electronic music and sound design techniques. Uh, that's part of the reason for uh, the readings, okay, uh, which I'll talk about uh, maybe in a little bit in a little bit here. But the idea of having all of these readings is to get you uh, to to help you build some familiarity with the reading with the vocabulary that is used to discuss these things, okay? Yeah, Hunter. Um, I was looking through the book. And mm -hmm. Something else kind of confused by it seemed kind of like a follow-along kind of thing. Yeah, it so, is. Uh, right. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I understood that because I've never really had a book. Like, I've used a lot of books where mm -hmm. like, hey, use this program while reading this. Thing. Yeah, so, so this, this is the book he's talking about. So this is the required textbook. This is the book that we'll be doing the most readings out of, and it is kind of built as a follow-along in Live and in Max for Live, okay? Um, it, I think it... It can work if you're just reading it. Uh, the, the best case scenario is that you're sitting with the book and live and, and working through those examples. Um, there are a number of examples that he describes in the beginning that you can actually download example projects so you can see some of the techniques that he's using, basically, so pre-built live sessions that you can download and open up and see how they work, basically, as he walks you through things. Okay? Yeah, Hunter? Um, and so our first reading is on Monday. Yes. And then are we going to have, like, because it, it seems like we would have to, like, Kind of figure out how to use live before we use textbooks, because or like in terms of like. I th he pretty much starts in chapter one from like ground zero. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, do get a copy of this book and do start reading it in conjunction. I will say the first reading is chapters one and two from Monday. Uh, we will probably cover. Uh, those of you that uh, you got the information about the uh, workshop tomorrow. Yes. Okay. Um, we will probably cover as much ground, if not more, than is covered in chapters one and two uh, tomorrow at the workshop. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the workshop in a minute. Um, so yes, syllabus matters. Yes, textbooks and readings. Uh, there are three projects. If you scan to those pages in the syllabus, uh, you'll see that there's three projects we're going to do. Um, the first two are more composition-y composition oriented creating a work of music okay uh, and I put in I put in there pretty pretty explicit guidelines as far as like what the project must entail okay you can read through those on your own you're all advanced college students I trust that you can read okay um, I don't know can you guys see what's the minimum time duration on those projects two minutes okay that's that's in the in the good so you guys are reading the syllabus already good I like that um, Two minutes is the minimum. There's no reason you can't pursue longer than that. But I, I wanted to kind of, those of you that are maybe want to be more on the sound design end of things, I wanted to kind of give a, a bar that is more advanced than you get in the 100 level class, right? But not too far for those that are, that are maybe uh, feel like they need to work on their composition chops as they go throughout the semester, okay? Um, but the idea in those first two projects is to create a, a piece of music. And we're going to use, this, this textbook is organized around genres, okay? So we're going to use those genres as the jumping off point for your projects, okay? Uh, so you'll, you'll need to 
explicitly name a chapter that you're, you're using as a guide, basically, and a genre, and use that as a jumping off point for those compositions. Those of you that are composition majors, right, you are all working toward a senior recital where you have uh, a program of works that are original works, and one of those is supposed to be an electronic music composition. Uh, this is your chance to get a start on one of those. It might not be in its, don't think that it has to be in its final glory by the time you hand it in for the project in this class, basically. But if you have an eye toward that goal of having an electronic music piece on your senior composition recital, use those projects as a starting point, okay? Yeah? Um, I don't know if I'm joking with that too much with this question, but when you say sound design, is that for electronic music, or is that, like, are we going to do, like, anything involving film, or so that's where things open up is project three, which is exactly where I was going. So thank you, Hunter. I didn't, I'll, I'll give you your pay later. Okay, so um, yeah, the project three, you'll notice, the, I mean, really the first, if I could have left the description at the first sentence, I would have, okay? Um, the first sentence is solve a problem for someone else using sound, okay? If I could have ended there, I would have, but I think you all would have rebelled in terms of not having some more guidance, basically, about how we're going to do that, okay? Uh, but there's a lot that you can do with that prompt, right? Okay. Uh, the things that are, to me, are key to that, though, in terms of it being a sound design task is that it's for someone else. You can't solve your own problem. You have to solve a problem for someone else, okay? That could be, I don't know, those of you that are composition oriented, that could be a commission for somebody for their recital, basically. Okay, that's a problem. I, I need a piece on my recital, solve that for me. Okay, that could be a, a sound design for somebody's film project, but it needs to be someone else's film project. Okay, I wanted to get you out of this box of constantly creating stuff for yourself and make you more other focused. Okay. Um, and so the, the, I think that is key that you're going to have to solve a problem for someone else. You need to use the uh, you need to use the skills that we're covering in this class, but it's kind of open for you to define what that problem is that you're solving for someone else. Okay, uh, we'll dive into that a little bit more as we get to it. Okay, but uh, that I think is where things will open up in terms of sound design tasks for video, for video games, for uh, I don't know, for just acoustic design in the environment, basically. Uh, you know, I could, I could imagine, you know, somebody who's upset about the crosswalk audio prompts, basically, and you want to design better audio prompts for the crosswalk, which if five of you do that project, I'm, I'm going to be regret saying that as an idea, basically. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily need to be a creative project. It could be, I mean, that is a creative task, right? But it's not a necessarily a, a strictly creative outcome where I'm creating this work just for the sake of creating art, basically, okay? Uh, it can have a functional purpose to it as well. Make sense? Okay. Uh, attendance expectations, those are in the syllabus, and I'm, I'm running into what I said was going to be my outer limits. Uh, I've already mentioned the, the schedule. Are the attendance expectations clear when you look at those? <coughs> What's, what, what, how do I distinguish between, those of you that have had me before maybe explain, uh, what, how do I distinguish between excused and unexcused absences? Yeah, Hunter. You have to watch the class and then write a like a response to it. Yeah. yeah or the not the class, the you know the recording. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So just so we're clear, absences are unexcused by default. Okay. It doesn't matter if you overslept or you had a an away game or a concert or whatever. It's unexcused by default. It's up to you within one week to watch slash listen to the recording and if the recording doesn't exist it's up to you to contact me and say hey I missed class I need an assignment to make up the absence okay uh, the burden is on you to do that within one week of your absence okay uh, the goal of that policy is that we keep you up to speed and up to date on what's going on in the class and you don't get behind just because you missed class make sense uh, but make sure that you understand that it's unexcused by default and will impact your grade by default unless you take action. Okay, Hunter. Um, How is it going to work with classes that are based on hardware? Uh, it, I will try to film stuff whenever possible. Okay. Um, when we have our guests, I'm not going to, I'm going to, well, 
I may try to film those, but you, it's going to be hard because they're not used to using the technology the way I'm used to using the technology. So if anything, those are going to be days where I have to kind of come up with an alternate assignment, basically. Okay. Um, so right off the back on the schedule, everybody knows about the workshop tomorrow? Is everybody able to be here for most, if not all, of the workshop tomorrow? Are we meeting here? We're meeting here. The workshop is here. It's being facilitated here. Okay. Um, officially, we'll kick off at 10.30. Our guest uh, workshop facilitator will be here probably between 9.30 and 10. I'm planning on being here between 9.30 and 10 to open up the room. So if you want to get here a little early and chat, you can do that. Okay. Uh, but we'll kick off around 10.30, go to noon. Okay. Uh, we're ordering pizza. Uh, and when I say we, actually... Uh, Ableton has been a very good partner about us adding their software. So they are actually buying us pizza for this workshop. They are actually paying for this facilitator to come in and, and teach you guys Ableton Live. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, they're excited about adding another school and, and they see what we're doing. So uh, they, they want, you know, they want another place to be teaching Ableton Live, basically, okay? Um, so one of my final questions is going to be pizza toppings, but I don't want to do that just yet, okay? Uh, I want to get to what, uh, so this is uh, stepping out of the syllabus now, talking about how to tackle the readings, okay? Uh, open up another tab, and I want you to Google digital audio versus MIDI. So please do this. Oh, I need an internet connection. I don't have an internet connection up here. Oh. Uh, the very first article should be something on, yeah, I think that was it, uh, Christian. Click on that first article. What is the name of that website? Music? Musicfutures.com. Okay. Uh, my thought process here, I wanted to kind of really clarify what I want to do with the readings this semester. Okay. Um, there are reading reports you need to do to show me that you have done the reading and that you have, uh, uh, let's see, gotten the information out of it and that you know uh, the things, the pieces of knowledge that, uh, that I, I need you to know going into uh, the, the class, okay? Uh, but those reading reports, rather than being, uh, my internet is uh, not doing so hot up here. Awesome. This is not going to be good. Okay, Wi-Fi. Should I try faculty staff? Sometimes that works. Often it does not. Hey, look at that. Okay. Okay. What I want you to do right now, real quick, this is a really short article, okay? Uh, and one of the things we need to recap is digital audio versus MIDI, okay? Because we're going to be dealing with both of them in a lot of these environments. So I want you to read this real quick, and then once you're done reading, if you go to the syllabus and fact folder, oh, and I got to log on here. Great. This shouldn't take more than five to ten minutes. Click on the syllabus and fact folder, and there's a, uh, a link that says, what are these reading reports going to look like? When you click on that, oh, it shouldn't say error for you guys. It should actually open up one of the reading reports, which is, it's a quiz, but it's, you're going to see that it, there are all these open-ended questions, basically. So do this reading and do this uh, practice quiz. Is it working for you guys or no? I'm getting an error. Yep. You're getting an error. Everybody's getting an error, yes. You got through? Someone forgot zero. Oh, gosh. Awesome. You know, things work in practice. OK. <laughs> Let me see if one of the other. All of my quizzes are busted. Great. Okay, well, let's scrap that demo. Um, let me see if I can go to course tools. Okay, this is me improvising. Wow, I can't even get to the place where I... Okay, I'm going to have to investigate this, okay? Um, the quiz looks something. I think I've got it saved here somewhere else. Here we go. These are the questions from the reading quiz, okay, when you get to them. Okay, and what I'm trying to do here is get it so that you're not so 
scared of these. Uh, I, I'm using the quiz functionality, but I want you to think of these as reading reports, not quizzes, OK? Uh, and I was trying to do it in a format where you didn't have to type up a, a paper every time, OK? Uh, like a, a one-page summary, OK? Uh, literally, these questions are, was this reading helpful? How much time did you spend reading? And I asked for it in minutes so that I can kind of track and see how much time people are doing with this. In as few words as possible, what was the main topic of the reading? List five key terms that you feel are important to understanding the main topic. Pick one of the key terms and uh, explain it to me as if you were explaining it to someone who doesn't know what it is. And then are there any key terms that you think you, you need help understanding in class? Okay, That's the reading report. Okay. It shouldn't take that long after doing the reading to fill this in, okay? But this is you certifying to me that you did the reading for class, okay? I wanted it to be something that just you have to check in and I can kind of get a sense of how people are doing with the readings, okay? Uh, and that will help guide me in my class preparation. If I need to spend more time on this rather than that, I can kind of do that based on the responses I'm seeing, okay? Make sense? Yeah, Would Casey. You like us to like it's I actually have it set up as a Likert like strongly agree agree okay. no okay. opinion okay. disagree okay. strongly disagree okay mm -hmm. um, so these are set up they're set up as fill in the blanks basically is yes. the, uh, what I was trying to do using the quiz functionality but <laughs> apparently I've got I've got to work on that this afternoon because even though I had it all set up IT found a way to broke it so. Looking at the reading of digital audio versus MIDI, um, we were going to complete a practice survey. So answer me this. What, what is the difference between MIDI and digital audio? Looking at this. Let's give, uh, I'll, let me give you, one, those of you that didn't read it, I'll give you like one or two minutes to read it. If you finish, look up just so I can see. Get a sense of if I can start. Anybody still needing to read a minute? Or need a minute? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay. So, MIDI. MIDI is an acronym. What's the acronym? Yes. Musical instrument, digital interface. Musical instrument, digital interface. Okay. Uh, how old is MIDI? When did MIDI start? Whereabouts? Uh, 80s, but when in the 80s? Early 80s, yes. That's, that's why I kind of, uh, on the 70s, basically. Okay. It kind of comes out of hardware synthesis in the 70s, where they're looking at creating this standard for be able to communicate between hardware synthesizers. So 1981 is when the initial paper uh, for the universal synthesizer interface is published. Uh, so we almost had something called USI rather than MIDI, U-S-I, but they changed the name of it the next year to, to MIDI and we've been using it ever since basically. Um, how, what, what's, what's the diff what sort of information does it encode? Does it encode audio or does it encode something else? Instructions is the word that the article uses, yes? Okay. So the idea that it's, it's an instructions on how to perform the music, okay? That's a key piece to understand um, MIDI, okay? What's the difference between a, synth and a, a MIDI synth and a MIDI controller? I don't think that's in the article, but I know that's something I cover in 161 at least, yeah. Uh, the synthesizer actually creates the, the digital sound on its own. The yeah. MIDI controller just sends instructions to another. Yeah, so the controller just sends the instructions. 
these keyboards that we have in this lab, are they sensor or controllers? Controllers. Controllers, right? You have to com connect them to the computer in order to actually get sound, okay? Um, do you guys know about the different message types in MIDI? Because these are going to come up. Things like, if I say things like note on, note off, control change, program change, do these sound somewhat familiar? I'm seeing some head nods, okay. We're going to be using these um, most likely in the Max environment, but we will be using different uh, MIDI messages to uh, control things. Although in, in live, you will use both the note on, note off, and control changes for different uh, purposes, okay? Um, and these are, these are a series of bytes, right? Which means that there's how many bits? Eight, Eight which means that we're dealing with uh, what's, the, what's the range that keeps popping up when you're dealing with MIDI information? The range of numbers. Zero to 255, except that one of the bits is actually for whether it's a status or a data byte. So only seven bits is for encoding information, which means two to the power of seven, which means what? What's math? Yes, math. There is math in this class. Sorry. Two to the power of seven is zero to 127. You're going to see that range pop up time and again because things have been built around the MIDI standard. You're going to see zero to 127 pop up from time to time. Uh, digital audio. When we're talking about the digital audio that uh, this article is talking about, uh, do you know uh, PCM? Does anybody know that acronym? It's familiar. It's familiar. Okay. You've seen it before? Yeah. Both WAVE and AIFF uh, files are PCM files. Okay. It stands for Pulse Code Modulation. Okay. It's the idea that we're sampling different moments on the waveform. Okay. That's different than MP3, which is still digital audio, right? But it uses a different perceptual encoding schema, okay? M4A uses a different schema, it's, okay? But uh, WAVE and AIFF use this pulse code modulation. If I talk about uh, what are the two kind of components that we use, when I say CD quality audio, what, what is that? What, did any numbers jump out at you? Not 24. Uh, 44. Point one, yes, kilohertz is the sampling rate, right? What's the other part? Uh, it's the, it's usually one name. No, no. <laughs> Sixteen bit, okay. The bit depth, okay. The number of bits that we use for each one of those samples, each one of those forty-four thousand one hundred samples per second, okay. There's sixteen bits to encode it in CD quality audio. When we go beyond CD quality audio, which most DAWs allow you to, you can have twenty or twenty-four bits, or sometimes thirty-two. Uh, and some are now using 64 bits to encode each number, okay? Uh, but that deal, that, that results in a difference in the amount of data, right? So which is bigger, digital audio or MIDI? Digital audio. digital audio, by far, okay? And especially as you increase that bit depth, you're adding more and more data to the, the overall stream, okay? Um, what happens when I ignore the sampling rate and exceed... The uh, the Nyquist frequencies. Nyquist is that a name that rings a bell for you guys? Okay. The, uh, let's see. Although we introduced this in one six one, it's in synthesis where we really start to see the effects of this. Okay. Exceeding the Nyquist frequency. Yes, Alman. That weird variant where you have to have like double the sampling rate yeah. to achieve a certain quality. Yeah. Exactly. That's Nyquist's theorem. Okay. Uh, Harry Nyquist. Okay, uh, an engineer who came up with this theorem decades ago. I forget the exact year, but okay, it's named after somebody because it's his theorem. Okay, and he gets a, a frequency named after him. Okay, so if you can study hard, come up with your own theorems, you can have the the Flapel theorem. Okay, or that's you know the frequency or what you know. Okay, the Dieter frequency uh, that has a nice ring to it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's, okay, let's come up with so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we're going to see the effects of that in synthesis because we're actually generating frequencies inside, especially in Max. Uh, I think a Ableton is actually smart enough to filter these out and protect you from <coughs> aliasing this idea that when the frequencies fold back around, we're going to see that come up again, okay? Um, and what happens when we don't have enough bits to encode our, 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 our amplitude information? Do you remember the bad thing that happens there? Distortion, but there's a specific name for the kind of distortion. I don't know what's going on upstairs. Okay. 
It's called quantization noise. Does that ring a bell? Okay. When you've got uh, two little bits to encode the information, okay. These are things that were introduced in, I'm, I'm bringing this up because these are things that were introduced in 161 and you may have, if you've taken 361, recap some of these things, but they're going to come up this semester as we get into synthesis and processing. We're going to see the effects of these. Uh, so they're concepts that need to carry over. So if you need to refresh your, uh, uh, your knowledge of this, you can kind of look at, uh, look over, that's part of my reason for pinging this article. Um, I will say this article is probably because I wanted something you could read real quick in class. This is far simpler than some of the readings you're going to do. Okay, I'll tell you that right now. Uh, were you able to get to the quiz? No. Yeah. It, it like came back all of a sudden. I never had an issue. Oh, you never had an issue. Okay. Maybe it was the number of people trying to ping it. Okay. Well, so I put that link there in the syllabus in fact intentionally so you can practice the quiz before you do it the first time. And I, I, the only reason I'm calling it quiz is because. That's the functionality on Blackboard I'm using. If you So all of those questions that I put up there, hopefully you see that there's really no right or wrong answer to those questions, OK? So it's really a complete this, and you get the credit for the quiz, OK? Make sense? OK. Uh, there should be about 18 of them. You should have noticed that the, the reading reports are 15% of your final grade. So that gives me some wiggle room to drop one or two along the way, and for you to miss one or two along the way. But it doesn't give you wiggle room to miss 10 or 12 along the way without it impacting your grade. Make sense? Okay. So don't freak out if you miss one. Okay. But uh, do get in the habit of, of doing the reading and uh, completing this. Okay. I have seven minutes left. Okay. And in seven minutes, I would like to sound a middle C with both Ableton Live, Max, and my modular synth that I brought today. Okay. Do you think I can do it? Challenge? Yeah. Challenge accepted? Okay. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to flip over to live. Okay. You don't need to get that off the stage there. Okay. Okay. So live. Live has two views, uh, which you've gotten used to this two views in uh, other DAWs. In live, they're called the session view and the arrange view. Uh, let's see. I'm going to. Uh, click on a MIDI track here, okay, and if I click on one of the slots and it's shift command M will create a MIDI clip for me, okay, and when I zoom zoom back out, I've got a little, uh, this should look somewhat familiar, right, this uh, piano roll view, okay, I can then use the B key to change myself to the, uh, the pencil tool, and I can click on that, and I can enter a C4, which is my middle C, yes? Okay, and I'm going to uh, extend it so it's a quarter note. I'm going <laughs> to zoom back out, okay? Uh, and if I hit play right now, I'm not going to hear anything because I haven't put a synthesizer on this track. But this clip, if I trigger it, should start playing, okay? I just need a synthesizer, okay? Uh, you don't insert synthesizers on the tracks in live. There's actually a tab down here where you can work on your signal chain. Okay, and I'm going to go to the analog item and I'm just going to drop it in here. And if I turn this on and turn up my speakers, hey, look at that. Okay, I've got a middle C playing out of Ableton Live. Okay, so you just learned a little bit about session view, putting in a MIDI clip, piano roll. Pencil tool, putting in a C, okay? There's a little bit of detuning going on there. Okay, I'm going to leave that open. I'm going to hide live. I'm going to open up Max, okay? I'm video recording this, so if you're not able to follow along, we can do this later. Max has... Max, unlike live, shows us nothing when we first open it up, okay? Uh, in fact, one of your early readings is going to be a, a something from the creator of Max talking about how I learned to love a program that does nothing. Okay, when you open up a patch in Max, which is the, the term that's used for these in Live, it's Live Sets in Max. It's a patch. Okay, uh, again, it looks like there's nothing going on. Okay, you've got a toolbar at the top where you can drop objects in, or if you're like me and you've been using it for 20 years, you start to learn keystrokes. And so I will type in an Easy DAC which is going to give me a little speaker icon. That's what I can use to send sound out to the sound card, OK? I want an oscillator. Let's see, you guys want sawtooth, triangle, sine wave? What do you want? Square, square? OK. Uh, let's see, square is, no, it's not square, is it? Squirrel's fine. <laughs> Squirrel comp does something else, basically. Uh, I think I have to do, uh, wow. 
rect. That's what it is. Because the square is just a rectangle. The square is just a rectangle that is uh, equal sides, right? Okay, so rectangle is the thing for it. Okay, if I turn this on right now, I have to lock the patch, turn it on. I'm not, it says I'm getting sound, but I'm not because I believe right now the default, let's see. Yeah, I'm not hearing anything, okay? I need to give this a frequency, okay? So I'm going to unlock my patch again so I can program some more. I'm going to create a number box, and I'm going to type this in here. And I should now be able to play a C, which is 261, thereabouts. Hey, there's my middle C, okay? Uh, if you don't, if you're not uh, a geek like me and you know your frequency to note conversion, okay, um, you can use an object called MTOF, which is MIDI to frequency. Okay, and I can connect that. I can create another number box. And now when I send in MIDI notes like 60, which is middle C, that's the MIDI note for the middle C, it'll play the same thing, okay? And I can change. I'll leave you with, but our goal was middle C, so I'll leave it there, okay? So, okay, so that's max, okay? Now, hardware, okay? Uh, and since I can't have everybody gather around the campfire here, I'm going to open up QuickTime real quick, uh, because I have a camera attached to my laptop, right? So I can just use a new movie recording, I can make that full screen, and I've got this weird... 1984 thing going on where I'm big on the screen, okay? So, so our new Euro rack here, okay? And the gentleman that donated these to Stetson will be here in two weeks to talk a little bit about what he does and why he got into modular synthesis because he is not a musician by trade. He's actually an engineer. Um, but he donated these. Then we purchased this uh, lovely uh, traveling case, which should be good enough if you want to do a, a if you need, have a, a, those composers that are doing uh, gigs in the, uh, Elizabeth Hall, it should be able to travel real well over there. Uh, people that are doing uh, things on campus. I don't want you like taking this to your gig in Miami next week, basically, okay? Can we agree to that, please? Okay, so uh, I turn it on, okay. I've got the output already connected, so I jump-started the process a little bit, but I've got uh, lovely blinking lights. Everybody see that up there, okay? Uh, and right here I've got an oscillator module that if I connect it, let's see, if I take the square out and connect it to left mono and then turn this up, I should... Let's see, how much do I have to turn it up? I might have to turn this up. That is not, that's background home. Okay. Square out. Ah, turn that up. No, is it because I'm in sub mode? I had this working in my office before I left. I only have one minute left. Come on. Let's see. I've got the level. I've got that level. I'm kind of concerned that that's coming out so loud. Okay, let's see. Square out. It's not working. Let's try the tri Hey, there's the triangle. Okay. Oh, sick. Middle C is where? I don't have perfect pitch, so some of you that higher. What? Okay. All I have is a knob. I don't have. I can't put in a number to get the exact thing. Okay. So there's going to be a, some imprecision with this, but I mean, listen to that. Lovely golden tone. And it goes really low too. Watch the speaker. Okay. And that's just that's just an oscillator basically. These things sound pretty bad. Uh, this and bad meaning bad meaning good, okay. Uh, this also has a MIDI input 
module right here, so you can actually connect this to some MIDI producing advice and drive it that way, which is actually pretty cool because the MIDI input device also has an arpeggiator, so if you play chords, it'll arpeggiate through the chords and do all kinds of fun stuff, uh, which I had fun, a couple fun afternoons this summer playing around with. Yeah, Casey. So, are those all 500 series, it's like, style rack units? Like this is what, it's called Euro rack. So, so like, theoretically, you put like a 500 series compressor in that? Or is it only like it's generating signal, so you can send it. That's the thing. It's, it's all modular. You patch things in and out, and you can send the signal wherever you need to, basically, before you finalize it. Okay. Um, let me close this. Go back to my slides, because I know we're out of time, right? Okay. So my final question for you guys. Tomorrow, pizza toppings. What should I do? Should I just do, like, cheese and pepperoni, or do I need a vegetarian option as well? Veggie, okay. If I do one veggie pizza, is that going to be enough for people that want the veggie option? Yes. So I'm thinking one veggie, three pepperoni, three cheese, or do you want like something with more on it? Hawaiian pizza. Hawaiian? Okay, so if I do one veggie, one Hawaiian, three pepperoni, two cheese? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to do that tomorrow. The other thing that's not on your schedule, uh, next week, next Tuesday night, Daryl Holt, Daryl Holt, which is a name if you don't know it, he's actually a Stetson alum, not of digital arts, of some other uh, program uh, accounting, but he's actually COO of the EA studios down in Maitland, okay? Uh, he's going to be on campus speaking next Tuesday night. You have to RSVP online. We sent out an email to all creative arts students, so look for that and uh, consider that option for next Tuesday night. I'll let you go there. See you tomorrow. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you.